my name is Ashka, and today I will be talking about feminist medicine and new age. So a little bit about me, this is what I like to do both uh, in school and extracurricularly. Uh, and I'm a senior at St. Francis High School. At school I love to peer tutor and TA. I'm the secretary of the World Language Honor Society, a member of our Social Justice Affinity Council, and am the co-founder of St. Francis's first ever intersectional feminism student association. I hope to be a public health slash biochem major next fall, and so one of my favorite intersections between healthcare and social justice is actually what I'm going to be talking about today, feminist medicine. So starting off this presentation, I actually want to cover the history of non-feminist medicine, medicine, starting with historical misrepresentations and the resulting technological consequences, and then understanding the information gap. So, look at the image on the screen. I'm going to give you guys about 10 seconds to think, to think about what this tool could possibly be used for. Okay, keep, <laughs> keep that image in your head. So this was just a more primitive version of this, the modern chainsaw. In fact, in 1780, two Scottish doctors invented the prototype of the chainsaw. But not as we use it today, but as a, like, as a tool to cut down trees or clear debris. Instead, doctors John Atkin and James Dufresne invented the hand crank chainsaw to cut through the pelvises of delivering mothers who were having trouble pushing their babies out. It was called a symphysiotomy, and it was largely done without anesthesia. In fact, mothers were completely conscious during the entire process. Crazy, I know, but I guess we can give them some leeway as it was in the 1780s and they're not really known for their hygiene or medical advancements. But let's look at another example. So this looks like a really fun-filled invention to liven up a playground, but I encourage you to think again. Because in fact, in 1963, a patent application was filed by George and Charlotte Blonsky to facilitate the creation of a machine that would help mothers give birth through the use of centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is the outward pushing force created by a rotating object. So basically, the apparatus would rotate at a speed of about seven Gs in order to create enough centrifugal force that the baby would shoot right out. Oh. But don't worry, because the contraption also included a net, of course, to catch the baby. So I guess it was kind of humane. Just joking. But when did the patent and this usage of this contraption expire? In 1980. Now we can't justify this astounding lack of knowledge with history. In fact, this machine is so recent that my parents' generation still includes people who could have been birthed by this. This, therefore, is the problem of medicine over history. A traditionally non-feminist way of practicing healthcare, which through lack of knowledge about women's health, as well as the lack of female voices in healthcare spaces, has made medical care downright dangerous for female patients. When our knowledge is not accurate, our technology consequently hurts instead of helps. So why do we need to understand this information gap? So although childbirth is the quintessential female experience, and those two um, inventions were specifically about that, there are so many other examples of women being exposed to danger in other fields due to a lack of knowledge. There's chemicals in feminine hygiene products, car crash test dummies which are exclusively designed for men. In fact, if you look at the image on the right, there it shows the average weight difference between a male and female car crash test dummy, which is completely disregarded by tests as of May 2022. So that's pretty recent. Office temperatures hurt female metabolism, and women are at a higher risk of workplace injury. This exists everywhere, but it is in medicine where this gender data gap becomes dangerous or even fatal. In fact, Betsy Reed from The Guardian writes, For most of human history, though, this perspective has not been recorded. Going back to the theory of man the hunter, the lives of men have been taken to represent those of humans overall. When it comes to the other half of humanity, there is often nothing but silence. And these silences are everywhere. Films, news, literature, science, city planning, economics, the stories we tell ourselves about our past, present, and future are all disfigured by a female-shaped absent presence. So now that we recognize the gap, what exactly is this difference? 
This leads me to the second part of my presentation, which is all about the biological truths and their implications, where we'll cover feminine versus masculine medicine and 21st century knowledge gaps with a study on postpartum depression. So there are many overlooked and widely unknown biological differences between men and women, besides the obvious. The metabolic rate, body temperature, differences in hormones leading to differences in how men versus women react to medicines. For example, men are more likely to have heart disease, stroke, diabetes, whereas women are more likely to have arthritis and depression. So based on this evidence, a single medicine should prescribe alternate dosage as well as different ingredients for men and women. But the image to the right de depicts a size comparison with a human hand of the birth control side effect sheet, which effectively disrupts female hormones which practically dictate everything from metabolism to managing stress and anxiety. These side effects include extreme weight gain, chronic agony, horrible nausea, migraines, and extreme mood changes, all of which can completely dis disrupt one's daily life. Instead of working with female hormones, Modern birth control simply suppresses them, leading to much more harm than help. Continuing on, there are many sectors and fields besides medicine where this gap is also seen. The difference in immune systems and hormones also play a role in how chemicals are absorbed. Women tend to be smaller than men and have thinner skin, both of which can lower the level of toxins they can safely be exposed to. This lower tolerance threshold is compounded by women's higher percentage of body fat, in which some chemicals can accumulate. Chemicals are still usually tested in isolation, and on the basis of a single exposure, but this is not how women tend to encounter them. Take the nail salon industry, for example, a field which is disproportionately female-dominant. Because of the latest drug research, we now know that many of the chemicals and fumes such as formaldehyde, toluene, and dibutyl phthalate generated by nail polish removers, polished creams and gels used in the sex salon are cancer, lung disease, and miscarriage causing. It's not a coincidence that a nail salon smells overwhelmingly like gasoline. And these workers are spending eight-hour days breathing in these fumes and coming into contact with them by skin as well. An anonymous healthcare professional confirms we know more about the perils of dust on gold miners from a hundred years ago than we do about the effect on modern cosmetic toxins on our women. Furthermore, differences in chests, hips, and thighs can affect the way that straps fit on a safety harness. The use of a standard U.S. male face shape for dust, hazard, and eye masks means they don't fit most women. When it comes to frontline workers, poorly fitting PPE can prove fatal. In 1997, a British female police officer was stabbed and killed when using a hydraulic ram to enter a flat. She had removed her body armor because it was too difficult to use the ram while wearing it. In fact, there's so many issues with this supposedly standard-issued protective vest. It's more like a male standard that has been harming women for far too long. So now we've gone over modern examples in all fields that, just, that show just how dangerous it is to disregard the difference in female versus male biology and thus their needs. Now let's look at a specific medical case study. So postpartum depression, or postnatal depression, is based on the same diagnostic criteria as a major depressive episode, but with the onset of symptoms, examples listed here, occurring during the last month of gestation or the first several months after delivery. And this is from the National Library of Medicine. So currently, besides the occasional support group or mommy blog or pain med, we don't actively recognize or look for postpartum depression in new mothers until it is too late and the depressive episode has already taken a toll. Although many pain medications are given, antidepressants are only offered to new mothers if she has had a past history with depression before pregnancy. And this has historically led to women who were completely fine just days before their delivery fatally harming themselves or their children just days after birth. They were chalked down to be hysterical, and their very real depressive symptoms were called female hysteria or sensitivity, leading to so many unneeded deaths. In fact, this is so recent that the first pill in the history of the world to be developed specifically for postpartum depression was only approved by the FD FDA two months ago. And the placebo pills for Zuran alone on the image 
Continuing on, it is important to recognize that mental health is not a gendered issue, but when it comes to postpartum depression specifically, it's important to note that it's extremely unheard of, which makes it all the more dangerous. In fact, as the National Library of Medicine dictates, suicide is the leading cause of death in the perinatal and postpartum period. And looking at the graph on the right, it quantifies how much certain symptoms or situations actually affect postnatal depression. Now looking at this list, family problems, unwanted gender of baby, marital disharmony, poor health of a woman, and baby sick. All of us, including me, I'll admit, would just chalk this down to, oh, this is normal, there's always a period of adjustment, oh, it's just baby blues. But the fact is, this is the reason so many women are undiagnosed and are harmed as a result. These seemingly normal things actually really disrupt a new mother's mental health. So how do we address this? What can we call this lack of information? This leads me to the last part of my presentation. What is feminist medicine? Well, we're go, where we'll go over definitions, recognizing stigma and bias, and how to advocate. So first, I would like to actually introduce Dr. Anne Fausto Sterling. She is a former professor at Brown and is a leading expert in biology and gender development. I was so impressed by her work when I was researching colleges earlier this year and her message that I contacted her and I was very fortunate to receive a reply. So I'd like to share some of her work. Fine. Um, I was very struck by the fact that um, extremely prestigious scientists were involved in this business of finding women inferior based on biology. And I'm talking about your Charles Darwin's and um, all of the early founders of psychology. Um, and I had colleagues at the time who read my book and said, well, it's just bad science. And so my question was, how come it's the top most rewarded scientists in the world who are doing this so-called bad science? And that I, I So this is from her talk, Feminist Approaches to Science and Medicine, where she completely debunks the claim that feminism is a female uh, issue. Uh, and that was from Brown University Symposium to honor her and her work. And I just wanted to share her own words about the subject because I think she sums it up pretty well. You know, we applaud our modern scientists, but the truth of the matter is that they practiced bad science in the gender aspect, which has harmed medicine for centuries. Five. So on to the definition. Gendered medicine, or feminist medicine, is a new discipline that studies the effect of gender on general health. In fact, the women's health movement empowers women's knowledge regarding their health and battles against paternalistic and oppressive practices within healthcare systems. So moving on to recognizing stigma and bias. The word, the feminist movement has been largely stigmatized throughout history, especially the word feminist itself. But we need to recognize the intersectionality and uh, intersectional feminism was actually a term coined by activist Kimberly Crenshaw, over to the right. And it basically talks about the smaller groups within the female umbrella that are further discriminated against in different fields. And in healthcare specifically, in US healthcare, um, the, most, the biggest intersectional uh, female group that has been discriminated against in our history is African American women. In fact, Harvard School of Public Health professor T.H. Chan said, Generational trauma from Jim Crow laws have caused disproportionately high rates of breast cancer due to damaged estrogen receptors in this community. In fact, African American women have still have the highest maternal mortality rate, followed closely behind by indigenous women. Racist ideas of African Americans being likened to animals cause many doctors to withhold anesthesia from black women during childbirth and C-sections because they theorize that African American women couldn't feel pain in fact, the man who we credit to be the father of modern gynecology, J. Marion Sims, tested all of his theories and advancements on enslaved women without anesthesia before he opened a private clinic with white women who he, of course, operated on with anesthesia. So how can we not realize that the, feminist, the feminine medicine we had created, with, we had credited with being so modern and radically effective was created, was created from the pain and torture of female minorities? Unfortunately, things like this are not part of our history books or our science lessons. 
so we are unknowingly learning non-feminist medicine ourselves. So how do we fix this? Now on to the action item part of my presentation. The first thing is education, spreading knowledge as well as creating spaces for discussion regarding feminist medicine. Um, and that's what I like to do at my school as well. It was always something that I was really passionate about, uh, being really excited about social justice and healthcare. But what I found is that so was my school community. They wanted to have the discussions. They wanted to spread the knowledge. The second thing is always actively seeking to bridge the, this gender data gap. We should always question the notion of writing the word man in important political documents like our Declaration of Independence mm -hmm. and in literature to refer to women as well. You know, we sometimes dismiss this, that, oh, it's fine, like, we know what it means. But this idea, this concept of a male standard branches to all other fields, and it is in medicine where this standard can become dangerous and fatal. And finally, we need to recognize the need for feminist medicine and female voices in healthcare to change past harmful procedures. So again, one of my favorite things about this topic is that it's happening now, and it is our opportunity to educate ourselves as well as an opportunity for the new generation of healthcare workers to address and recognize. Now, glass vacuums, rotating birthing devices, and chainsaws aside, progress in feminist medicine results from awareness, amplifying female voices in the field, and open minds. Thank you. I can now take any questions. So, it's not actually a question. So I feel like when I went to some drugstore, I I start to like find the like men version um, vitamin, woman vitamin for the kids. Might be it's a good start because you guys, young generation. Yes, I totally agree. This new uh, vitamins are probably one of the only things that have consistently made the difference. Mm -hmm. um, Prescription drugs, not so much, yeah. um, because uh, men and women vitamins can be for very different things. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, it's definitely just a start, and now we have pills specifically for postpartum depression. Yeah. So I think it'd be really cool to see what new prescription drugs start to make that distinction in dosage and also ingredients. Yes. Yeah. Question? Not really. Okay. It's a good. Yay! Thank you.